Now, in the ever-evolving landscape of insecurity in Nigeria, the recent report by SBM Intelligence paints a very grim picture of the country's ongoing battle against kidnappings. Despite numerous efforts by government and security agencies, the kidnapping crisis continues to escalate, leaving civilians vulnerable and undermining public trust in the state's ability to protect its people. The report indicts security agencies for their failures, highlighting how poorly coordinated, under-resourced and fragmented responses have allowed criminal elements to operate with an impunity across the country. Hmm. And the situation is particularly dire in regions like north-central Nigeria, where criminal groups have trans uh, transitioned from simple banditry to more sophisticated forms of organized crime, including targeted kidnappings for, for ransom. Now, the report also underscores the growing boldness of these armed groups who have ever begun to successfully you know, target and overpower trained security personnel. This alarming trend raises critical questions about the effectiveness of current security strategies and the overall capac capacity of the state's security apparatus to maintain law and order. Now, to help us unpack the findings of this report and delve deeper into the implications for Nigeria's security landscape, we are joined by Confidence McCarry, Senior Analyst at SBM Intelligence. Confidence, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having Yet again, us again, we always look forward to when you come because we learn new things. Yeah. And uh, this time, it's not going to be any different. Yes, it's not. indeed. <laughs> now, let's talk about Nigeria's security architecture. Let's talk about what was noted inside of the report, how badly coordinated it is. How does that put Nigeria in the grand scheme, uh, scheme of things when it comes to uh, intelligence and security, where do we rank? Yeah, um, I think we rank poorly. If we In a scale 1 to 10, where would you put Nigeria? If you're looking at it from a regional context, I think in terms of if you're looking at it from a regional context, it won't be the highest in terms of how worse it is. I think Nigeria is number one. Uh, in terms of kidnapping, I'm not, now I'm not looking at insecurity generally in terms of the region, because of course there are some more terrorized countries like Mali, Burkina Faso and the rest of them. But in terms of kidnap for ransom, I think in the wider region, Nigeria is uh, actually number one. Uh, you made mention of how poor security fragmentation has made the fight against insecurity really, really bad. Uh, but at least we've seen a little bit of progress in the past, uh, in the past year, uh, where security agencies, especially between the police, the military, have been coordinating and they've been increasingly relying on the use of citizen militias such like vigilantes and everything but it hasn't really been enough because uh, most of what they usually do nowadays is um, is reactive it's not it's not preventive so there's a lot that intelligence can be used especially when it comes to predictive intelligence uh, such as preventive policing can be done but not much focus has been done they're mostly reactive so in case if they hear about any kidnap issue they tend to respond when they want to, if they feel like, and not necessarily in prevention of that kind of a thing happening. And I think the kidnappers have known that there's a 50-50 chance that they get away with this mm. thing, and it hasn't really stopped them. So they try to change that odds from 50 to 70%. So more often than not, it works. And so the more this thing works, the more it keeps incentivizing them to, for them to take, uh, to take some more. Your report also highlights that the boldness or the increasing boldness of these criminals attacking even trained security personnel. Yeah. And so I have to ask, what does this say about you know um, the current state of Nigeria's security infrastructure? Uh, it says a lot. Uh, one of one of what he says is that um, the security situation has been so so bad that even things or people you consider off limits in the past are no longer off limits. Um, nowadays, I think where the there was should I say a a, 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 a moment of light or something like um, you know a revelation in the in the sense of the word where in the past it would have been difficult or would have been unthinkable for a kidnap group to attack a seven military officer, but what happened in 2020 with the attack on the NDA, the abduction of so many security personnel, the attack on the Kuji prison facilities and everything, has sort of opened people's eyes that they could actually attack these people and then they get away with it. Uh, in many in many other high-profile attacks on security personnel, especially within the military framework. The military has not successfully rescued those people without the payment of ransom, even though they will not publicly admit it. So these kidnappers know, I mean, I mean they have a network by which they communicate with themselves. Uh, so they know that if they kidnap a military personnel, it's not really going to amount to much. The military might not necessarily succeed. And I think part of what gave them that boldness was the reports in 2020 or 2021 that um, I, th I think it was from the Wall Street Journal of Financial Times. I can't remember who that said the Nigerian military had to pay or the Air Force had to pay 
bandits, you know, to to prevent them from shooting President Buhari's plane when he was flying over Zamfara. So these kind of things give them a boldness. So you get to see the display of this boldness on social media where you see bandits displaying what of Naira on TikTok and everything. And then even so far as, um, you know, bandits calling out the Minister of State for Defense for actually being their sponsor or something along that line. So they know that the, the faster they chip at something and then they do not get enough pushback, the faster they tend to go after that thing. And that is the story of the Nigerian kidnapping for the past four or five years. Mm. Hey, um, I, I'm, I'm hoping we have a little bit of time here because I wanted to ask about this detail we're actually just showing regarding the numbers, yeah. specific numbers from specific states. Can yeah. you give us a correlation between the states and why these numbers are so, like Zamfar has got the record high. Yeah. Why Zamfar? Yeah, so the, the situation in Zamfar is multifaceted. There are things like banditry, there is the old, the perennial clash between the rivalry between the Hausas and the Fulani settlers. And then you also have mining, gold mining. And, you know, there's also the jihadist element. So as of last you year. You want to go back there now? Mining. Yes. So minerals. Is yes, also minimum, especially gold. Ah. You know, so what the Buhari administration came up with the presidential gold mining initiative where you mine your own gold and then you give a cut to the states. And then the states, or if you want it, states to help you sell it, no problem. Or if you want to sell it yourself, no problem. So um, that kind of a thing was a solution to the mining problem where um, the government has put their own stake in it, but it wasn't really, really reaping benefits. So they're like, okay, let's just let you do your own thing. Get your own gold out, give us our own cuts. But what it has done inadvertently is that it drove a lot more people into those kind of mining. And then we now have a situation where bandits and the other jihadist elements are also trying to control those mines. You know, so it has led to a portfolio of so many actors. So the penchant for a law and order breakdown was very, very high. So as a result of that, many, many criminal groups have taken advantage of the fact how broad the area is and how widespread it is into the geopolitical zone where you have forests that span up to like four states that are even bigger than Western Europe in size. Mm. So you don't have that enough security breakdown outside of Gusso, the capital. And if you look at the states across the Northwest, the, the capital that is most hit in terms of security is Gusso, the, cap the capital of Zanfara. So it's a whole lot of, it's a whole lot of uh, security nightmare that goes on there where even the presence of security forces is so sparse and it's so well spread out that it's difficult and almost impossible to stop the problem. Mm. Well, we're going to come back to this conversation. Uh, Confidence Macari is a senior analyst, security analyst at uh, SBM Intelligence, and he's talking to us about the report that indicts security agencies as kidnapping continues and even increased uh, in the last uh, year. We'll take a short break to bring you the headlines, but afterwards, this conversation continues. Stay right there. have Confidence McCarry from SBM as we discuss the present state of insecurity in Nigeria. McCarry, thank you for staying. I've got one very interesting question, yeah. one that we actually discussed about from before. Uh, what's that on your face, Judith? <laughs> you look so cute. <laughs> in any case. I'm, I'm reading my tab. <laughs> Let's talk about the, um, the uh, resignation of the last NIA boss, and that is in, by the name of uh, Ahmed Rufai uh, Abubakar. Abu yeah. Now, as we saw certain videos of people jubilating in certain offices, but that's not the concern here. The concern is what efforts did he put in terms of national security that we should be concerned about in the past six years that, where he's uh, held office? Um, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a question that I have direct answer to, given how secretive the Nigerian security is, intelligence well, Judging by the stats that we have, yeah, uh, is so judging by the stats that we, it, or is it going down? Yeah, it's not definitely not going down. We've, we've now seen different kinds of crime, even between the ones we already have, we're now seeing different mysticization under the different ones. So it's not like crime is going down. Uh, but if you want me to speak to the day-to-day -day or what exactly was the input as NIADG, that I can't say because even as basic as the budget of the agency is classified, mm. you know, it's the same as the DSS, you know. So if I get to know about it, it's no longer an intelligence agency. I don't mm -hmm. know if you understand what I'm saying. But um, if I am to make a broad-based calculation on how its impact or the impact of the security agencies are during its tenure has contributed to national security, I'd say it's not much. And I do think that uh, most people expect the security situation to improve because, of course, they pay taxes to the government and the number one function of government or the number two function of government is a protection of lives and properties on their, their, do, on their, their domain, uh, which we are currently not seeing. But I will, do, I will make the bold statement or the bold claim that the Nigerian security services or the Nigerian security architecture is not designed 
with national security in focus. It's designed for regime security. So if you that thing that even the creation of the NI as we know it from 1986, 1987 when Babangida had a regime dismantled the former national security organization and created the DMI, created the NI, created the DSS, it was to perpetuate his own rule, to keep it in, to keep it in, uh, to keep it in office, uh, to make the government cool proof. That was why he did that. So it wasn't like as if uh, since the re return to civilian rule, that has largely changed. It mm -hmm. hasn't changed. So the current security architecture is designed to protect the man in Asorok, not necessarily, to, uh, not necessarily designed to protect the man on the streets. So in that particular case, if you look at it from such narrow perspective, you could say that they've done their book. They've done their best. But if you look at it from a national security perspective as to how bad things have gotten, I would not give them a pass mark on that. Now, with his resignation, it means that an office is vacant, right? And it means that... Um, uh, all eyes are now on the presidency or the legislative to see um, who is going to be taking the role, taking yeah. up the role. What is in store for this person? What is this person to anticipate? What are they to anticipate if they are taking up this uh, this mantle? I, I think one of the things they have to look out for is, I think, the president's own security agenda. Um, President Tunubu has not really been that kind of a person that is big on security. His focus has mostly been on the economy, So, um, which was why when he got in, despite changing the service chiefs, he didn't really touch the intelligence uh, chiefs. So I think he would really need to key into what the president's security agenda is, if he has any. And then from uh, a regional perspective, where Nigeria is trying to gain back its influence, especially as regards ECOWAS, one of the things he has to do is to look at where Nigeria's security diplomacy has been badly beaten. Uh, one of the important things that Tinubu did, or which is profound, is that he replaced the outgoing DJ with the head of Nigerian mission in Libya, which, of course, successive Nigerian governments have blamed the instability from that country as foiling the security problems in Nigeria. I think the general administration did the same. The Barry administration did the same, saying that arms from Libya has flowed all the way from the border with Chad down to Nigeria. So I think, I point to that kind of a person, like, comes with the kind of experience, especially security diplomacy along Nigeria's immediate and external borders. So one of the work that is cut out for him is how to leverage that influence, given the experience he has gained with his posting in Libya, to actually make Nigeria security, uh, Niger to make Nigeria's domestic security better, and which would always come when there is an improved coordination between the NIA, the DSS, and whatever other uh, agency that the Office of the National Security Advisor is actually supervising. In the past, we used to have these problems where they used to work in silos. I can speak for the uh, security services, especially within the paramilitary and the military services, that there is an improved level of coordination. But for the intelligence services, I cannot see. So where the onus of that lies, not necessarily within the responsibility of the NIADG, it's for the Office of the National Security Advisor, which whose office supervises these other agencies. So if he is able to coordinate the intelligence gathering and the intelligence deployment better, especially tailored towards national security, I do think that we're going to see an improvement security situation going forward. So, so no end in sight to our palaver? <laughs> The, the, so the, there's not there's, there's not one size fits all. There's no silver bullet for it. I think it's little improvements here, little improvements there that's going to that. And, and the problem, the mistake we keep making is that is in thinking that the situation to Nigeria's security crisis is kinetic. It is not. Mm. The problem is mostly economic. If you read the reports we are talking about, you see that the kidnap crisis has been exercised so badly that you're now seeing 15, 16 year olds going into kidnapping. And then the kind of ransom they demand is mm -hmm. crazy. And mm -hmm. what exactly do they use it for? So, so buy food to survive. So if you have a situation where you have even people at the lowest rung of society going into this and they don't care about their lives, I think more than using force, you have a bigger problem on your hands. Well, if you started the show with us, I actually answered that question for Judith. I'm yeah. wondering why she forgot. Judith, don't you remember we sang it together? Uh, one day, one day, you life go better. Go better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a little joke from the start of the show. Thank you very much, no Harry, for joining us and giving us some yeah. interesting I love having you on details the show. from yeah. that yeah, report. It's always very too. informative. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned. Yes. Yeah.